Mr. Pat Vaughan, sir. How are you? And Good thank evening, you very, very Brendan. much for, for doing this with me. No, no, pleasure to be here and looking forward to the conversation tonight. Absolutely. I was thinking earlier on today, it's about 15 years since I joined uh, your team in, in EY in Dublin. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, I was uh, coming from an internship in Luxembourg, if, if you remember. It was my first mm -hmm. kind of role. And I, and I haven't told you this before, but you made a huge impression on me back at that time, as you did on, on many of, of uh, my, yeah. my colleagues and peers since. And you were one of the yes. first kind of senior leaders that I uh -huh. taught to myself, you know, I want to be like this guy. And <laughs> you really stood out because I think of, of not only obviously because of your extensive experience and expertise, but the way that you um, carried yourself and, and continue to and treated people. And it was always yeah. friendly open you were always very um yeah. giving with your time and you treated you know everything everyone from your fellow partners to a junior uh new hire mm -hmm. like me exactly the same and i was always so impressed by that and uh well, really okay. excited to talk to you today uh, well thank you brendan it's nice of you to say things like that and and uh, certainly very humbling for me to listen to that but uh, i always treat everyone equally uh, and i think that's a, probably an attribute that i get from my parents uh, as well because i could see just the, the respect that they would show to the milkman in the morning uh, to the bank manager in the afternoon um, and they always had time for them so i guess it's influence i suppose from early on uh, with my family that brought that through but thank you for mentioning that nice things no, not at all, not at all. And you're, you're currently um, the head of and partner of cybersecurity and mm -hmm. IT forensics in PricewaterhouseCoopers. So what I thought we might do is maybe we'll start off and maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, that role and your team there and what it's like in, in kind of that IT consultancy world. And maybe then we'll dive back and yeah. uh, talk, talk through how you arrived there. Yeah, no, no problem. So start with the present. Uh, which is what I like to do. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, currently, uh, as as I as I stand, I am the leader of the the cyber security, um, the privacy and the forensics area of PwC Ireland, and uh, it's a great position. I, I feel very privileged uh, to be in that position because uh, not alone uh, it, is it work that I really enjoy doing and getting out of bed in the morning is still a spring in my step. But actually the brand and the profile of the firm is, is really strong as well. And, um, you know, I've always been attracted to big brands and, and to, to big corporates. Uh, I probably couldn't work for Pat Moran Enterprises um, because I can see how much I can learn from other great people that are in those big firms and make them the great firms that they are. Um, so I really enjoy coming to work even in a virtual setting um, within PwC. There's probably, Brendan, about 45 people in the team. Um, I interviewed somebody this morning and they paid me and, and, and the team a really nice compliment they said that the reason that they wanted to come and the reason why they were being in that they wanted to be interviewed was because they heard that PwC were doing all the exciting uh, cyber work in Dublin, uh, which was a really nice compliment to get. And um, yeah, we, we, we have a great, great team inside. Cyber has a very topical area currently with a lot of high profile incidents and events in the press. Uh, and I'm, I'm lucky that I, I work with a, a great bunch of people uh, that are high performers, high achievers and very interested like myself in coming to work each day. Yeah, fantastic. And if they, for, for young um, listeners, Pat, that, that are thinking of, of going down a, a career, let's say in, in PwC and, and are interested in, in you know, cyber security, what kind of qualities are, are you looking for in um people that want to get into that mm. side i mean what 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 are the areas and strengths you look mm. for well it it might surprise you and and um maybe your other listeners that uh, actually the, the technical pieces i'm less focused on um 
because I, th I think I think everybody is clever and everybody has their X factor and uh, I think you can always train good people um, but good people need to have good values and I'm quite passionate about um, you know a set of values that align very well with my own personal values uh, and within PwC we have values like acting with integrity um, which you know is really important um, working together uh, is another really key one for me and uh, reimagining the possible uh, is, a, is another one again there are three values that we aspire to align to and behave uh, within PwC and they're ones that, that really are important to me uh, because I want to work with people that are not just smart and intelligent technical people, but I want to work with people that are open with me and say, actually, Pat, I don't think I have enough experience to do this particular job and I need support from you or somebody else. Uh, I don't want the individual that says, yes, Pat, uh, you're the boss. I couldn't possibly show any weaknesses. Um, and... Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, I'm, but I mightn't get the result you want. I don't want those kind of people. I don't want the yes, um, yes boss people. I want the people that will show and act with integrity. Second value that's important to me is that working together piece. And working together is, is really, really important um, in professional services, and I'm sure across a whole load of industries, including your own one as well, because we're only as good as the team that we have behind us. Um, and the clients don't see me every day, but they see my team every day. And if I put out my best team, uh, like Warren Gatland in the Lions rugby on Saturday, we, we, I will get the best results uh, and I will win each time. Um, so that value of working together and the team being a cohesive group and working together for an individual purpose is really important. And the third attribute that I think is really important, and particularly for the younger people that are listening today, is reimagining the possible. So I'm all on for innovation and I'm all on for change. And of course, in our worlds today, the, 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 our business worlds and our personal worlds are changing so quickly, so dynamically uh, with technology, with communications, with how we do things, with the cloud-based technologies. And, and I, I want to hear from people um, that have ideas that can reimagine the possible and change things going forward. So the technical piece is important, um, Brendan, but I kind of take that as red because I think everybody has the ability or the passion to be able to aspire to good technical results. But the most important thing for me is what set of values has this individual got when I'm looking at them, interviewing them for a particular job? Do their personal values align with my personal values, which are really close to PwC's corporate values? And that's what's really important. Yeah, that's that's great insight, Pat. It, it resonates a lot with me as well, because I think when you're in that interview situation and people, especially, you know, when you're starting out in your career, you can tend to focus on, you know, the technical and this is what I know. And maybe you don't really show your yourself and the kind of person you are and you lose out in doing that, because, as you say, that's the most important thing, especially when you're starting out and trying to enter into a team. Um, I think it's yeah, very, very well said. Um, and then, I mean, just talking about the technical aspect, we're going to take it, I guess, right back. You, you did computer science in, in university and maybe talk a little bit about, well, mm. even before that, what drove your, mm. what drove your choice of uh, degree early on? Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, um, I'm giving away my age now, but l let's say I, 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 I did my leaving cert safely in the, in the last century, uh, in the, in the mid eighties, Brendan, and uh, the mid eighties feels like a long time ago. And of course it probably is and was to, to a lot of people, but to me, it's not that long ago. Um, but it was a time when, if you can imagine, um, there was no Googles, no LinkedIn's, um, you know, the FDI investment uh, that we see in the country today, which is fantastic, uh, hadn't really taken off. Our membership of uh, EU uh, was just starting to get traction, but, 
you know, the IFSC as we know it today in Dublin uh, wasn't established. So it was quite basic. Um, and when I was coming out of school, I went to um, a school in, in the city called O'Connell School. Um, and I was in the A stream, um, which might surprise some of your listeners, um, but uh, <laughs> a number of people were, were actually um, leaving to take jobs as, may, as, as a postman. Um, some people, a lot of people were uh, emigrating because that was the de facto um, choice for a lot of people doing their leaving cert. There wasn't a lot of money in the country. People, um, and, and again, some of your lo- younger listeners might um, be very curious about this point in that probably only, even though I was in, going to a very good school and ourselves and Belvedere College would have been the two rivals. So it was kind of at that standing. But maybe 10, 20% went to third level. Not that many people went to third level. The reason for that was because there wasn't an awful lot of funding uh, within family homes to be able to do that. And, you know, I referenced my parents earlier on and, I, you know, I, I'm very close to my mom and, and my dad sadly has passed away. But but they wouldn't have had uh, surplus funds to be able to send their four kids to university. So I took a decision with their guidance uh, to actually go into mainstream industry after I left school. And I went to a company called Irish Life and uh, it was a great company and it still is. And at the, at the time, uh, there was dr- droves of people joining every week to do different things. And uh, I got a job in the pensions group and I knew nothing about pensions. And because I was starting early uh, from, as a school leaver, um, I still remember my salary it was 6,800 uh, punts, uh, Irish pounds at, at the time. And I was thrilled with that. That was my annual salary, not monthly. It was my annual salary. And um, I, I started off um, doing a job uh, where I was actually distributing computer reports to up to about 20 administration units within Irish life. Now, you might think distributing computer reports would be very technical, but actually what I got was uh, a bank of paper um, about a fo- one foot deep perforated. And my job every morning was to actually go through that one foot deep paper bank, to split it into 18 sections and to distribute it to the administration functions within Irish life. And that did a few things for me. One, it got me meeting 18 different people every morning. Uh, so I, I think I improved social skills and hopefully interpersonal skills. Two, it opened up my mind about how are these reports being generated and what's behind them. And I would get some queries from some of the individuals about this isn't the information that I expected in the report and uh, I'd go hunting what the, why that was the case and I'd talk to the technology people and they'd give me some answer and I would share it with them not really knowing what they said to me but share it back with the individual administration group but it did get me thinking and it did get me figuring out how could I figure out more what's going on in that computer that produces this one foot deep bank of, rep- of paper every morning that I have to sift through with my ruler perforating it out and going to the, the different administration groups. So uh, don't worry, Brendan, I'm coming to the crunch line now soon. Um, <laughs> but um, Very interesting. Uh, I, 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 I spotted a course that I could do at night time, which was called com- a Bachelor of Computer Science in Trinity College. And I did it. Uh, for four years and what was great about it was um, it was a great stepping stone for me to get to understand a bit more about technology and computers but uh, two was it actually it was it was a, a career path decision that when I now look back that was a significant step for me to make it was quite a big undertaking it was an investment in time um, and it was a difficult and challenging enough. I can remember some nights being in the lecture halls at 7.30, having done a full day's work and the head starting getting heavier and heavier and falling onto the desk at some point, I'm sure. Um, but it, it was a great 
opening of my mind into technology and how computers worked which obviously was quite different back then but still was a, it was a good opening and from that i was able to um jump from there into a aib and aib put me on to their programmer training so i actually learned how to use pro programmer language then and i could start coding so within a few years actually i had enough knowledge from my course that i did in trinity and from my programming experience in AIB then actually I, I could have could have probably had a good go at coding the the program that produced that one foot of paper for back in my Irish life days so that's really how it all happened a uh, uh, long way of saying it but a, probably a, a very different path to most people it is different but it, I mean it's fascinating and, and really I guess when you look at that it was your natural curiosity from in that role in Irish life which sort of started the whole path of you know asking questions getting behind those reports and then maybe putting you into that course in the evening and then going on from there yeah it's it's very good now would you that natural curiosity i mean that's very important isn't it even in your you know the, the role as you've gone right through your career having that is quite important i would have thought yes yes it is it is i mean it's funny that that um what they call it in you know internal audit world brendan it would be maybe a healthy skepticism uh, and we we use that phrase quite a bit in external orders as well but i i think it's 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 good isn't it it's a skill set that not alone is is interesting for you in your professional career but also in your uh, personal life as well in terms of you know just being a little bit curious my um my mother-in-law who is uh, 90 uh, is a great woman and uh, her her mind is still very active and uh and i've not always noticed from her that she has you know a very good sense of um learning all the way through and to be curious all the way through and to just get into conversations that you know you'd never expect to be in with her but i think she it's a great advocate for somebody maybe at the later end of her life um and and to maintain that level of curiosity and 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 Incredible. puzzlement i think is is a really good one to have fantastic yeah it really is it really is mm. and i mean if you 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 eventually went into consulting so yeah. at what point did that decision come into your was that an organic move or you you directed yourself actively into it yeah, I I joined, uh, and this is going to um, st strike a, a chord with you. In in my AIB days, when I was doing my programmer work and and, and developing programs, um, I got uh, allocated to the internal audit function of AIB for a number of years, and uh, that was great fun because I was doing a combination of things. I was developing programs to extract information from the branch systems and to, again to give those and uh, to give that information those reports uh, to the field auditors who would then go out to the branches and say can uh, we see some risky loans here owned by pat morn um we'd like to see more evidence or probably the collateral and the underwriting behind those because so it was almost like they were auditing in advance and, and you know it was quite progressive in the late 80s early 90s to be able to to do that and that whole area of audit automation was starting to kick off and we're using different analytical tools which are still used today uh, by various different internal audit groups um but i was also as part of that um chapter of my life I was also going out myself into technology groups within the bank and assessing their controls and 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 to interviewing them to find out what technology they have what risks that they have how they're managing those risks and i was really enjoying it and and then a, an ad came up in the paper uh, i still remember the the ad and it says computer risk management consultants and i really liked the title and i i i really caught my eyes oh I, i'd love to be one of those um, and I said, like, I'm going to give this a shot. Uh, and of course, it was with a company called Arthur Anderson. And uh, I'd heard a bit about Anderson um, 
before that and they just heard about their profile and back to their brand and 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 their their um their culture and uh i did my interview did a few interviews and i could see them looking at me a little bit nervously uh but uh i was able to get past all that i think um and they offered me a job as a computer risk management consultant and the reason they were looking at me a little bit nervously was i was the first person to join arthur anderson uh, from industry and so everybody wow. else had gone through their probably then this is the cookie cutter was the the bcom and the mac in the ucd um and you know had gone to the good schools and all that and nothing nothing wrong with that but that was their model that they used and it worked very effectively for them now they were hiring somebody that would come in straight from industry and what i noticed about it was is kind of interesting the difference between industry and professional services and again for your some of your younger listeners who are trying to juggle about what what direction do i go and what do i do after college a fundamental difference for me when I joined Arthur Anderson was the meetings that I couldn't get into as a banker uh, within when I was working with AIB. I couldn't get into them because my manager um, would get that opportunity and his manager and or her manager and her senior manager. So you had to wait in line for your opportunity and you had to wait in line for your ticket to come up in the corporate world, certainly at that time. Mm. In the professional services world, you were thrown into it in the deep end. And those meetings that I couldn't get into because I was two or three rolls behind in the bank, the next day I was in the, the equivalent of those meetings in different clients. So I just felt that that was an incredible opportunity. And I could see why Anderson was so successful and many professional services firms are, because what they do is they throw really high performing people into the deep end with the armbands on and they monitor them like the lifeguard and they'll pull them up if they're sinking and they'll jump in if they need to but most of them won't most of them will learn how to tread the water really quickly and adapt really well and 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 i really that's what i really love about professional services you see people blossom that perhaps in industry they would blossom as well, but blossom at a much later stage and probably at a, a more sl- slower stage. So for me, the the real attraction now looking back uh, of going in from industry to professional services was just that opportunity to grow and, and develop. I used to work, uh, Brendan, with uh, a great guy. Um, he's an American chap that um, in PwC, since gone back to the us and um he was one of my managers at the time and uh he was interviewed by one of these um trade magazines um and he was asked what does working in a professional services firm feel like look describe it to me and he said and i'll I'll do it i do a terrible us accent but i'm going to give it a go he says man it's like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> <laughs> and you know the guy was spot on you've got so yeah. much opportunity coming left right and center at you and you hopefully can remember this from your ey days you've got I so do. much resources that you can dive into you've so many good people around you you know you you, you you're just blessed it's like being in an orchard with the, with the apples on the tree um, and I think if you're a young person and you've got that aptitude and you've got that energy, it's a great place to learn and develop and prosper. And, and I think that was the real big plus for me, and is, which is why I've stayed in professional services from that day I joined Anderson in 1996 to where I am today. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. And you touched on it there, Pat, as well, you know, moving from, from industry into the consultancy world. And you've given some great advice, I think, for the younger listeners. And, and maybe if we can just expand on that for maybe people that are thinking of, you know, they've already started their career. They could be mid-20s, mid-30s. And now they're starting to think, well, that's what I want to do as well. What advice would you would you have for those people that are thinking of making that move today? Yeah, uh, I, I think shifting 
across i think when you're mid-career or when you've done a you know a significant number of years in in, in industry and, and you're going to professional services let's let's take it that way first brendan and then, then let's flip it on its head and go professional services into industry and uh, I, I i think industry to professional services uh, i think is not a what i would say a seamless transition because the environments for very different um i sometimes you know let me give you just a real practical example um in industry you'll generally know who's on your team you'll generally know what de- deadlines you've got and what milestones you have for the year maybe it's a uh, an audit committee meetings maybe it's budgets and deadlines and year ends so your day and your team and your environment and your desk is very well structured and well, well defined. In professional services, you could be in Houston Station on Monday morning. Your people are coming in, people are coming out, people are sitting down beside you that you have never seen before. Um, there's all this dialogue going on that you have no clue what they're talking about because most of it's in acronyms. And people can become very lost very quickly because they come out of what they deem would be their comfort zone of 10 or 12 years in industry and are shift into this professional services environment. Um, so I always talk to, and I've hired lots of people and we call them external hires that have come in from industry and I, I'm one myself I, in professional. And I always say one thing to them. I, I say to them, um take your time in terms of integrating in don't be the hero from day one where we've hired you because you've got a skill set you've got attributes you've got talent that we believe we can use in our team you don't have to try and catch up on everyone in the first month that you're here uh, and, and we do a lot of coaching and we do a lot of mentoring and we give them buddy systems because we we know that that it's such a big change but I think once you ride the storm and once you get over that, I think then external hires do do, do really well. And we've got lots of them and, and, and lots of really successful people. And it's great, Brendan, to fuse that external hire industry experience with people that have, that have come in from college, essentially, and stayed with us as well. So that's the power of working together back to our values and, and, and having a, a much stronger yeah. team. Going, Brendan, from professional services to industry happens quite a bit as well. And um, I, I think people do it for different reasons. Um, and, you know, if you look at the the main business that goes on in big four, it's probably in three categories. It's assurance, it's tax, and it's advisory. And the assurance model largely is a bunch of people come in they do their training contract and a bunch of people decide to leave after that and that's just the culture and, and that's the way it happens across the world in tax it's, it's a little bit different they have training contracts as well but many of them choose to maybe stay for a little bit longer and and uh, and take that outcome and then in advisory which is the area that i'm in of just sort of the consulting corporate finance um area um it's it's interesting um we find that retention is probably one of our biggest challenges because the market becomes so buoyant the skills that you learn and you develop within professional services are very marketable uh, and and can be traded very well uh, particularly in the industry and rewarded and compensated really well so a number of people choose to um, move away from uh, professional services the pace can be can, can be pretty hectic at times um, it may suit individuals to um, just do something different perhaps they haven't worked in industry previously and they want they want to find out what it's like and we've got a number of people that that do that as well and and when i talk to our alumni that have taken that jump the resounding comment i get back is and perhaps it's a compliment towards professional services is yeah um look i i, I i'm enjoying it i'm 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 not unhappy that i've made the move but the quality of some of the things that i had 
in professional services just doesn't exist where I am. And that could be around people, it could be around um, the, the work environment, it could be around clients, it, it, you know, can, can be different. But the quality, and I suppose in professional services, we, we, we kind of, that's our, that's our trademark, it's quality in everything we do, which is the old EY motto. Uh, and quality is such an important part of of what we serve to our clients as well. So, so that's that's really important. So so I suppose that people can choose a different career path after professional services. Moving to industry is a really good one. But I think people just need to be a little bit have their eyes open going there. That is not as fast moving, and it probably doesn't have as much quality attached to it as perhaps they would have had in professional services. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Pat. And I think you might, you've answered, you certainly have answered this, I think, already, certainly in part, but I'll maybe ask it in another way, because you, you, you stuck in consulting, as you said, from Anderson days all, all the way, all the way through. Maybe, can you tell me what you think are maybe the top one or two things that are the best thing about a career in consultancy? And on the flip side, maybe what are the top one or two things that are the most challenging about a career in consultancy okay okay they're, they're good good questions i you know i suppose the best things i'd have to go to the people side of things uh, first of all because um you know so, some of your comments made me reflect earlier uh, on our experiences together and i suppose i am a people person at the end of the day and and that's that's what i enjoy and this working from home business is great from the point of view of no commute, but it kills me. It really kills me, Brendan, because I get my energy from going out uh, and talking to people, uh, either my own team or with clients. And when you're up stuck in your attic and all you're looking at is a screen for most of the day, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit deflated when it comes to the, the end of the day. So that you know, that's 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 the real plus I get, and um, and and it, and it's great. And and I think the, as I said earlier, you know, when you group together high-performing people together, you get just results that just blow me over from day to day. You know, in in terms of that, and so that's really positive for me. The, the 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 second area is um you know what's what's great about professional services and and perhaps other global companies have this as well but prof prof professional services do it really well and and when I look back on my career and I look back at the sort of the the changes that I've made and the decisions I've made and not all of them have been uh, you know. I've got I've got right first time, but but when I look back at these the successful ones, uh, I I've just I've taken opportunities that I've got in professional services and I've maximised them as much as I can, and I'll give you some examples. Um, so in EY in uh, 2007 2008, just before the financial crisis was happening, um. We were doing a big piece of work with one of the banks, and uh, you may well have been involved in in, in 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 some of this work. But but we're doing some work for some of the banks, and my key client was the chief information officer. And uh, I developed a good relationship with with that individual, and it was a long program, long project, but it was it was a very successful one, and. Um, she called me up one day and she, I could tell there was a, a bit of anxiety in her voice. And what had happened was she'd been doing an interview uh, with an Australian bank uh, for a chief information officer job. And somebody had leaked the information out before she even got offered the job, uh, had leaked it out and her bosses had found out. And Anyway, there was a lot of anxiety as a result we were chatting it through and I said, look, I said, uh, if you're getting chucked out um, and you need to do things, we'll, we'll facilitate you here in, in an office and, and we'll, we'll support you in terms of um, being able to manage your transition to Australia. And um, 
we have an office down there as well and we'll support you in terms of getting up to speed there so i think she really welcomed that which was great um and strengthened our relationship no end and when i talked to my ey colleagues in australia they were very keen to help and support and when she moved over a few months later the the ey colleagues said you know we'd like you to come out and support her and i said fine i like i can i could probably spare a few weeks uh in december which is their summertime in melbourne and uh i i would love to do no that. hardship no hardship and they said no not two months uh two years we'd like <laughs> um so i Julie said two years mm, okay I wasn't planning on that so I went home and I uh, chatted to um, Alison my good lady and uh, she said what we're moving to Australia I said no no that we have a proposal that we're going to move to Australia uh, what do you think and she said um, absolutely no way you're a partner a number of years in EY you know, your the kids have started in schools, good schools. Um, I'm very comfortable um, uh, where I am. Why would you not? I said, well, life's about opportunity. Life's about grasping things that are put in front of you and uh, maximizing it. And so within a week later, we had the tickets booked and uh, we were going <laughs> out uh, there on a, on a recce. And, uh, and that was a wonderful opportunity and probably one I, I wouldn't have got had I not been with a uh, a global firm in a professional services area and literally brendan i i brought my laptop that i had um into dublin office and uh, the same laptop uh, was able to link into the network when i arrived on day one in hour one in the melbourne office and so it was that seamless mm -hmm. and, and i could do that that's going back 10 years and i'm sure i could do that with my pwc laptop here as well but but that opportunity to actually be able to transfer to work in different cultures work in different cities and, and to support clients as well is a really important thing and um you know it's interesting the client relationship piece there uh, is, is really key as well and i think the level of trust that i built with my client here was instrumental in terms of taking that step across they're the, probably the two things I'd say around around what the big pluses are, the, the people side of it and the opportunity. I think the, the flip side is that um, we do probably uh, move at pace and uh, it's, it's an exciting uh, journey to be on. Um, but uh, you need to have um, good uh, people around you when you're moving at that pace. We talked earlier on about the power of the team uh, and and work working together um so you, you can't do everything on your own um you need to have a uh, good mentors and coaches and i've been very very um lucky in my career to date that i've had really good coaches um uh, both uh professionally but also on the personal side uh, as well a number of people that um, look out for me and and support me uh, because you do need that you, you, you can you can get that the pressure comes on at times and uh, you need to be able to recognize it and um, to look for the, the support structures that you know firms do put in place to be able to get you through those sticky meetings and those tough deadlines uh, and I think it's important that people are aware of that because that's not for everyone either and uh, I think it's something to look out for yeah and two things you said there that resonate with me, I think that the mentoring part is, is, you know, critical, I think, to have, have those people that can advise you and, and help you in those challenging moments and, and also working, you know, going out of your comfort zone and going to another culture, another country, something I've done a few times. You know, you learn a lot about yourself and you also learn yeah. a lot about other people and you can take a lot of good things. And I'm sure, you know, you, you had those, yeah. um, those experiences as well, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, and, 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 and Brendan, it's a great point because I think sometimes you have to do those things to value what you have today. And I'll give you an example in that, you know, I'm from a great family. I uh, have a twin sister I, and I have two younger sisters and I've, I've got a bunch of cousins and uncles and aunties and all that. And when I left to go to Melbourne, those people were important to me, but I felt that uh 
you know, I'm not going to miss them, or I can, I can, I can get by with a phone call or two, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll be able to manage my way through it. But actually, within a few months, I found that actually, they're the people that are the most important thing in my life. You know, clients are important, and Pat's important, and obviously my immediate family come even more more important. But actually, the people that you you really miss uh, are your your family um, and your mom and your dad and your your brothers and sisters and things like that. And uh, and and they're the ones that I now look to today to be my strength and my pillars and uh, my my confidants. So uh, so sometimes you do need to go away to realize that. And that was a big realization yeah. on my part. Yeah, it's very well said, and and I know you, you place you know a lot of importance on family, but it is and and that whole having the balance, isn't it, between career mm-hmm. and personal life? It, it it is such an important thing, and I know you've lots of interests, um, outside of mm-hmm. of uh, the career professional aspect as well, um, but it it is such an important thing, yeah. that, uh, and maybe it's something that, yeah. you know, when you start off in a career, you don't value, or you, not that you don't value it, but you don't realize the importance yeah. of of keeping that side of things going yeah uh, as well yeah no no i i think that's that's really key and um this morning like i had um great plans brendan um to to go for a 6 30 bike ride because you know in in ireland at the moment we're in the middle of a great summer that we're having and it's it's bright from 5 30 so I've been trying to do the Australian uh, and and be uh, be a biker uh, in the, the mornings, and I was all set to go. And then I got a text from my my pal to say uh, it's raining, um, so I took my <laughs> bicycle gear off. Um, and and maybe ten years ago, before I went to Australia, I probably would have gone back into bed. Um, but because you know I'm just used to getting up early and doing things now, I I did a session of yoga in the in the kitchen um, and. And, Fair you know, point. I felt energized and rejuvenated and being able to uh, get to the desk then um, after that. And I, I think that's that's really important that you've got that release and that balance. So I try to do something every morning or, or certainly in, in the evening time as well. Otherwise, um, certainly, the, you know, particularly in the virtual world, if you're not doing those kind of things, you're not getting your energy from going out and talking to your, your people on the floor um, you know there's something missing and it's not sustainable yeah yeah no fully agree with that and, and I've, I've spoken to others on, on the podcast as well about that very point you know the, the, mm. the whole physical activity part is so important even to help your I mean I find you know you said it it re-energizes it gives you a mental boost you know even before um we we're, we we uh, started recording here tonight i went down for you know yeah. 20 minutes kind of high intensity training right. and it's just yeah. it's like you're yeah. after waking up after it and yeah. you know you feel you feel good um and it's something i again i didn't focus too much on when i was starting out in dublin in my yeah. early 20s you know that to, to do a bit of that every day makes a, a huge difference you know yeah no no it's 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 really, really good we, we're lucky we have a gym in um in pwc in spencer dock in dublin and um you know with our new flexible working environment when we get back to it to work i can see where we you know people take time out during their day uh to to get that uh, bit of exercise and, and to energize th- themselves and uh i think that's that that level of flexibility i think is part of our new working world and uh, something that hopefully will be uh, useful and yeah. helpful to people yeah a couple of things pat before we wrap up you're, you're the only man that i know or woman that has done a ted talk and i know we <laughs> talked a little bit about it earlier um, and i watched it again during the week and i thought it was brilliant and as relevant then as it is today do you want to have a quick 
uh, yes, talk a little yeah, bit about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give you, uh, try to be concise as I can. But uh, thank you. My my counter uh, of of views now must be up by one. So uh, you, you and my mother, <laughs> uh, <laughs> my mother's watched it fifty times, I think. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'll watch it again next week and put it up another one. <laughs> she, yeah, I'll tell her. I'll tell her she can stop watching it. I've got other people to watch it now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh it's 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 a good story brendan it's a good story it's it's um the wanna cry virus hit um the the business world and uh the uh, the health world in a big way uh in uh, 2017 i think it was and um we decided within pwc to um make some videos uh, around WannaCry and the threat and how organizations should should manage the, the risk around it. And, and I, I produced one. And um, it, it got uh, some views by people that uh, are behind TED Talk. And um, cyber was one of the areas that they wanted to focus in on in one of their uh, TED Talk exhibitions and conferences uh, the following year. And um, so I got uh, contacted by LinkedIn, which is kind of interesting and a bit spooky uh, because, you know, I didn't know this individual at all. They saw the YouTube video, they were able to um, do their um, uh, searching and hunting for me via LinkedIn and got to me. And, uh, you know, I first, when I got the email, it was, would you be available to do a TED talk on cybersecurity in Monte Carlo in 2018. So my initial reaction was, okay, so this is definitely a phishing email. I'm going to report this immediately um, to the LinkedIn people. <laughs> and when I verified it with my uh, multi-factor authentication, which when you're trained in cybersecurity, you're always skeptical, aren't you, of, of uh, these kind of emails. But when I, I called them up, no, genuine enough, it was uh, somebody uh, that was very interested in me uh, performing uh, in TED Talk. Um, it was a fascinating experience. Um, I, I, I thought that again, back to maximizing opportunity, when did this ever happen again? I thought that um, it would be reasonably straightforward. I do lots of presentations, as you can imagine. But this one was very different. This one, uh, they, uh, I said, okay, well, I'll have some slides and I'll talk about X, Y, and Z. And this will do, no, no, Pat, no, uh, Ted uh, has this particular format. No slides at all. We want this to go really well, so we're going to book you in for four lessons with a, a presentation coach on video online from Amsterdam in advance. I said, uh, I don't think I need that because I've got lots of experience with presentations. And no, believe me, you will. And I would say, Brendan, those four sessions were the most intimidating, fearful sessions I've ever had uh, with any sort of coach. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I persisted with it. I, I think I got a little bit better as I went through it. And just the experience itself then in Monte Carlo was unbelievable. I had my uh, wife with me in the audience. And uh, it's one of those special moments, I think, Brendan, that I'll remember for a, a long, long time. And I was very humbled by the fact that um, the, lots of other individuals that were there, what they had achieved in their lives uh, was sort of, I was definitely in, the, in their shadows. But I was very humbled to be on the same stage as some of them. And, um, you know, the, what I liked about it, funny enough, afterwards was uh, a number of people came up to me in PwC who, who I didn't know. And they were first years and second years, you know, half my age and, and, and less than half my age, I'm sure, as well, um, that were so inspired by it. Uh, that that they that they had that they were working with somebody that had done a TED talk and that they were maybe part of a firm where somebody had a, done a TED talk and that for me and back to my people point earlier on that for me was the best part about doing it that um I had hopefully inspired a few people and and one person even said that that's on my to do list I am definitely going to try and to achieve that on I I hope they do. 
Yeah. An amazing experience. Thanks for sharing that. And it's well worth uh, a watch. I mean, it, it really is. So if anyone's <laughs> listening, you can uh, grab it on YouTube. Um, it, it's really, really good. And thanks. last last one, Pat, and, and thanks again for, mm -hmm. for taking the time. It's been a pleasure talking to sure, you. Sure, I've but enjoyed it. If, yeah. if, if, if you could meet um, young, young Pat Moran, you know, before he, <laughs> he joined uh, Irish Life, and you could have a coffee with him tomorrow morning, what would you what would you say to him? What advice would you give him, or or in general, what would you say? Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 that's a good question, and and I do think of this at times, and, and particularly as you kind of get into the the second century of your life, you know, you kind of look back a bit, don't you, and you kind of see uh, you, would I do anything different now? And of course, the stock answer is, you know, of course I wouldn't do anything differently. Uh, but if if you're there, being really honest, um, I think that there are are definitely learnings, right? And and for me, uh, it's a bit like going on a train but sitting in a seat backwards. So rather than facing your destination, I'm sitting in the seat that's backwards, and I'm I'm, I'm going the other way. And, uh, and I think the big thing that I would take from it is that I wouldn't be in such a, a, a passion and a haste to actually do things so quickly and to get, get places really quickly. So I was very, very enthusiastic about when I was in the bank, get to the next level, getting to assistant manager, getting to manager, getting to senior manager. And sometimes people that are in that vein and in that thought chasm they don't actually um they never get to the point where they want to get to they never they never achieve um happiness uh, and they're always hoping that the next stage that they get to the next promotion on the next job that they get they'll achieve that but of course when they get there what happens they're still not happy they want to get to another one so yeah. I do a bit more living in the moment. I do a bit more, actually, where I am, you know, I can learn and, and I can develop um, and, 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 and putting less pressure on myself to be, you know, they, they used to say, and, and this be a good maybe line to finish with, when I was growing up, the big mantra, the big motto was, 30 by 30 and what they meant what we meant by 30 by 30 was 30 grand by age 30 and it was a big thing to get to and not many of my peers actually made it uh, to get the 30 grand annual salary by the age 30 but it kind of it, it made us push through as fast as we possibly could i think you know i'd be saying to to my son and daughter who are now 22 and they they join the corporate world if they do and uh, i'd be saying to them you know get into a good organization and um, surround yourself with really good people and really good coaches and then live in the moment um, and don't be in a passion to get to the next stage and the next company and the next industry or whatever it is, but just enjoy where you are and um, and, and, and uh, live in the moment and forget about 30 by 30. <laughs> very, very well said. Very well said. And look, Pat, I, I could I could keep talking to you and maybe maybe one day we'll do a part two. But uh, thank you very sure? much for your time. Likewise. It's, it's yeah. been fascinating. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself. Thanks, everybody. Great. Thanks, Brendan. Best of luck. Thanks.